Hi, this is Bruce the Accounting Guy again, and we're working on a chapter on merchandising. Now, there are two different ways to account for inventory under merchandising for the sales and the purchases. One is the gross, the gross invoice method, and the second is the net invoice method. We're going to use the gross invoice method, and that's what I want you to concentrate on. So as you're doing your journal entries, do them for the gross invoice method. Um, also, there are two different ways to record that inventory. One is under the periodic inventory method, and one is under the perpetual. Of course, perpetual means never ending, always constantly moving, and we're going to do under perpetual, we're going to do the perpetual inventory method, and we're going to record our sales perpetual inventory under the gross invoice method. If that's not a mouthful, mouthful, I don't know what it is. You see, I couldn't even say it right. So, let's move on. What we're going to do is we're going to learn journal entries, first of all, for the sales side of it. Now, because it's perpetual, what we have to realize is, is that when we record our sales, not only do we record our sale, but we also will have to remove our inventory out of our inventory and into cost of goods sold. You know, when you walk into a store like Walmart or Target or most of the stores today, they all, they all have computerized systems. And really, when you run, when you run that that, that uh, merchandise over that little window or they go ahead and they put the scanner on it, they're really doing two things. One, they're recording the sale, but at the second time, they're also having their inventory updated and they're removing their inventory from their shelf so that the computer knows exactly what's left. In today's computerized uh, industry, therefore what they can do is, as a company like Walmart, their computer does all their ordering. It keeps track of the items that are going out the door. It knows what they have left. And it, a computer automatically reorders to make sure everything's restocked. So really, it's, it's doing all of that at one time. Now, what we're going to do when we do our entries is, is, one, we have to record a sale. And two, we have to record a cost of goods sold. So let's see how all that works. Let's take a look. As I said, you'll have this in your text. You have this on your PowerPoint. And now you're going to have it on the video. So let's take a look at our entry. Um, when we do record the entry, there are two things that we will always need to have. We will need to know how much that actual um, sale was for, and the problem will have to tell us how much the goods cost that we're selling so we can make the second journal entry, which there is, of course, to remove the goods from the inventory and put it into cost of goods sold. So if we come up here and we look at this first e entry on May 4th, what we have is we had a sale for... $3,800. Now, this sale has, is a sale for um, 210 net 30, which means that if, if, this, if this invoice is paid within 10 days of the date of the sale, which is more, more, I mean, May 4th, then they will receive a 2% discount. But when we go to record the sale, we will not worry about initially if they're going to take the discount or not. So therefore, that's why we call it the gross invoice method. We record it at the gross amount, regardless if, we, if the discount is going to be taken or not. So we are going to make the sale on account, 210, net 30. That's the, um, that, that, that is the, um, of, of, of course, the, the terms we're giving them. And we will go ahead at $3,800. We will debit accounts receivable. And notice again, as we do our journal entries, the debit's always first next to the margin. We indent and put our credit account, and there's the $3,800. And, of course, there's the explanation. Now, all we've done at this point in time is recorded the sale. Every time we record a sale, we must also record the cost of goods sold and remove the goods from inventory. So they need to tell us what these goods cost, and in this case, they supplied us with that, and it's $2,400. So what we will do is with our second entry, of course, a line is skipped here. I just drew a line here to show you that a space is always skipped between entries. And they would put again the date of the fourth, They're a debit the cost of goods sold because that is an expense. Expenses are debited. The debit goes first next to the margin. We indent and then put the account we're going to credit, which is merchandise inventory. We've removed it from our inventory, and that's $2,400. So again, as you can see, we've recorded the sale. And we've recorded the cost of goods sold and removed the goods from inventory. We have a double entry like this that we have to make every single time we have a sale because this is periodic inventory system, which means that as we sell the goods, we keep the running tab or the inventory by 
removing the inventory <coughs> when, we, um, when we sell it. Now, what happens is, is four days later, and again, we're just going to go along with the problem. Let's say four days later, the customer decides that they do not need $300 worth of the goods that we sold them. And there could be many re reasons why. Maybe we, uh, they overpurchased and they had come in and they were buying, let's say, lumber. They had a project and we, told, we helped them estimate it out and told them, hey, listen, anything you don't use at all, you can return. And so they, or there's something they were just unhappy with and they go ahead and they, they return it. That can happen too. And when we do that, basically what we have to do is, is we do have to, basically we're taking both these journal entries and reversing them out, but for only the dollar amounts of, the dollar, of what they're returning and the cost of what they're returning. And again, we would need those amounts. So I'm going to tell you that out of the sales, it's $300, but that the cost of goods of those items was only 140 And those numbers would have to be supplied to you. So, of course, you, th you figured, well, we would go ahead and re just reverse this entry by debiting the sales and crediting the accounts receivable. But when we go down to that entry on May 8th, you could see that, yes, the receivable was credited for $300 so that they won't owe 38 Now they'll only owe, what, 30 500, but notice what our debits do. It's not to sales. Accountants like to track things. They like to see what, you know, they don't want to just reverse out the sale. So we create a special account that we debit called sales, returns, and allowances. And a sales and returns and allowances is a contra account to sales. It means that out of the sales we made, of course, at this case, $300 of it was actually returns or allowances that we gave someone because they didn't, they didn't have to pay on that. And again, as you can see with that entry, um, <clears throat> we put an explanation and we skip a line. And now we have to put that, the, those goods returned to us back into inventory because we have them. Notice here, again, March 8th, there's the debit back in the merchandise inventory, but only at cost, not at $300. And then we reverse it at a cost of goods sold. So this entry here really is the exact opposite as this entry here for the amount of goods and the cost of the goods return, these two entries are just the opposite of each other. And the first entry here is fairly much the opposite. The receivable still reversed out. The only difference is, is we don't reverse out the sale. We record a sales returns and allowance account so that we can track what was returned. We have to do that whenever we have a sale. Now at this point, because we made a sale of 3800 we had a receivable of 3800 and now the customer returned 3300 we have to realize that the customer no longer owes us $3,800, but only $3,500. And if that customer pays by May 14th, this invoice in full, which is now only $3,500, remember we said we had terms of 2, 10, net, and the book goes through and explains those terms to you, but remember that when we say 210, that means the, the, the first number is the, per, is the uh, percent of the discount, and the second number is they must pay within that point in time. The N30 means it, they must pay the net within 30 days, which means if they miss the discount, they got to pay in full. So really, as long as they pay by May 14th, $3,500, they do not have to pay us the full amount back they can take a 2% discount. So let's say they pay on May 14th, and we receive it by May 14th. We would not expect $3,500 worth of cash because they only owed $3,500. And in fact, if you multiply $3,500 by 2%, it will come up to $70. So I would, when we open up our envelope, we're not going to find cash of $3,500. We're going to find the $3,500 minus the 2% discount of $70. When we come down to this entry here, on May 14th, we will see cash only came in of the 3430 However, they're satisfying us in full on the receivable, so the full receivable of $3,500, as you can see, has been recorded. Therefore, we're kind of out of balance because we're recording cash of 3430 but we're removing the receivable in full, and the other side of that debit that makes this entry all work out, this $70 here, is called the sales discount. All right, and that's a contra account, as we're going to see 
in a second. Now, the only difference between this entry and an entry May 15th on is, is that if we got this, if they paid May 15th on, they will have fallen out of the discount period. The original sale was May 4th. If they pay May 15th on, they have not fallen within that 10-day discount, and they will have to pay us the total 3,500. So the difference of this entry would be cash would be 35, the receivable would still be reversed out of 35, and the entry would actually balance with two $3,500 amounts and no what? Sales discount. Okay? That is the recording of the sales. Now what I want to do is I want to slide a little bit farther down this worksheet to this income statement at this point in time. And I want to summarize <coughs> on, an, on this income statement for the year end of December 30th, 2008, a couple differences that we have now, and that's the sales revenue. When you look at this income statement, you'll see sales of $480,000 all the way over here to the far right, and then you'll see the word less, and you'll see less sales returns and allowances and sales discounts. These two amounts we just ran into above in these journal entries. The sales returns and allowances, in this case of $12,000, represents past sales out of this 480 that this company made, yet they had some items either returned or they simply gave the customer an allowance. Allowance would be, let's say the customer came in and ordered some two by fours, uh, really didn't pick out what they wanted and said, we trust you enough to send over some two by fours for us. And when they got there, some of them were crooked, some of them, uh, I mean, were badly bowed. They weren't able to use them. They called up this company and said, we're not really into, you know, we really have some bad lumber. And the company says, look, just don't return it. We'll credit your account. And in that case, they'd still have a sales returns and allowance. So this 12000 represents the amount of these original sales that they didn't have to pay on, either because they returned some goods or they received an allowance. Then the other number is the sales discount of $8,000. That represents the amount of these original sales that did not have to be paid on because the customer paid in a very timely manner and received these discounts. These two numbers are considered contra accounts, offsets to sales, numbers that the company wants to track. So they come over here to the left, they say less these two dollar amounts, of course there's a dollar sign here because it's the first number in the column also, they draw a line underneath to show again a mathematical process, they add the two numbers together, they pull the twenty thousand dollars over, and when they do they subtract it from the four hundred and eighty, and now that's called their net sales. And what the net sales really shows is out of the total sales they had, this is all they were really eligible to collect on. They were really only eligible to collect on 460. The other $20,000 they never got, they never received it because of the fact of either a sales discount or some sort of return or allowance. And then the number right underneath it is the cost of goods sold, which represents the goods that they have what? That they have sold against these sales. When they subtract it out, that comes out to our gross profit. Now gross profit, also called gross prop margin, most of my clients have considered, called it a different term, they called it the markup. They said this is how much more we receive for the goods than what, what it cost us. Okay, at this point I want to stop for today and we'll go over the rest of this when we do the other side of the entry, which is the entries that a company makes when they record the merchandise that they purchased. So for now, it's Bruce the Accounting Guy.